Greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is actually going to be part of my book. And it's on why the King James or the Geneva Bibles. Now, let's take a look at some things. Now, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, you can do your own research and you can decide for yourself, which is fine. So, let's take a look at the what they call the manuscripts. Now, the modern Bibles all use what they say the older and better manuscripts. Well, one of them is called Vaticanus. V-A-T-I-C-A-N-U-S. Did you catch the four letters of that word? A-N-U-S. Why would you name something after the Vatican's backside? If you don't know what an anus is, well, look it up. Uh, when you go to the bathroom and you do number two, that's what comes out of your anus. And as far as I'm concerned, that is the Vatican's manuscripts. There's also another manuscript called the Synaticus. First three letters are S-I-N, Sin. It was found in the Sinai Desert in a monastery. There was a guy named, uh, oh, I gotta look it up. All right, I found him. His name was Constantine Simon Ides, S I M O N I D E S. He lived from 1820 to 1867. And uh, he was considered one of the most versatile forger of the 19th century. He sold all kinds of uh, manuscripts, which his method was to find a old piece of animal skin or what they call vellum or, or papyra. And he would make a forgery on it and then claim it was many, many centuries old and then sell it to the kings of Europe or royalty or whoever. On his deathbed, he said he had forged the Synaticus manuscripts. And I don't know how true it is, but when you start looking into these newer, well, what they say, older manuscripts that the Vatican uses, you will find they are sadly lacking. Now, why would anybody trust the Vatican for the Bible? I mean, here it is. This is the group that when somebody would try to give the people the Bible in their own language, they would kill them. The Vatican would kill these people. People actually died trying to give us the Bible in our own language. Uh, case in point. John Wycliffe. He spent on a considerable amount of time translating the Bible into English. And his Bible proved a lot of the Vatican's teachings to be wrong. So they actually used one of his Bibles to start a fire when they tied him up to the stake and piled sticks against him. They took some of the paper from his Bible and used it to start the fire to burn him alive. 
Yeah, these are the people. Yeah, we should really trust these people for our Bible, shouldn't we? I don't think so. Now, who did give us the Bible? Not the Vatican. Nope, it was the Greek church. You ever heard of the book of Thessalonians? Well, that came from a church from Thessalonica, a city in Greece. How about Colossians? That's from a city in uh, Colossae, a church there. Ephesus, Ephesians. You know, they collected all these letters that Paul had written in Greek, not Latin. The New Testament was not written in Latin, like the Vatican will try to make you think, but it's a lie. And they collected these books together, and they made what we call today our modern New Testament. So you got the Greek manuscripts, what they call the received text or the textus receptus. And of course, they'll argue and say, well, you know, it's, it's not as reliable as the older manuscripts, but that's another one of their lies. And they want you to cast doubt on what they were, well, on the Bible that you have. Now, the King James and the Geneva Bibles used the received Greek text. So I think they are better manuscripts. Now, one of their arguments is that the Vatican manuscripts are older, but they're, uh, they'll say that the King James Bible added words that are not in the older, better manuscripts. Personally, I think they removed words from the Bible. And in the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation, it says that if any removes the words from the prophecy of this book, and I'm paraphrasing, that God would remove their name from the book of life. And I think people that removed any words, they're going to find themselves in the lake of fire, which is where they belong anyways, because they re really deserve it. So we will get more into the things that they remove. And of course, they'll say the King James people added but my guess is this. Find the Bible that the world hates the most. And that's probably the true word of God. But let's look at the people behind the King James Bible. Well, let's look at Geneva Bible first. That was by uh, John Calvin. And a lot of people will say, oh, John Calvin, he was bad because he believed in election. And they'll tell you, oh, well, the Bible says that anybody can be saved. All they got to do is believe in Jesus. And these are usually the people that will tell you that uh, you don't, you know, works don't matter. All you got to do is have faith in God. Work, your works don't matter. Well, they should read James chapter 2. And then these are usually the people that'll say, once saved, always saved, or eternal security. Once you say a 30-second sinner's prayer, God can't throw you in hell no matter what you do. So if you want to keep that job as a hitman for the mafia, because it pays really well to murder people for them, you know, put hits out. Uh, if you want to believe that garbage, you can. But in the second chapter of the book of James, it says faith without works is dead being alone. Now, you're not saved by your works, but good works are proof of faith. Like I say, read James chapter 2. You know, works always precede faith and not the other way around. 
And of course, if you keep God's commandments, they'll say, well, you know, that's lordship salvation and you're trying to earn your, your earn your salvation. So really? So by not killing people, I'm trying to earn my salvation? Really? I mean, these people, they're, they're heretics and they're devils. And one day God will do what he needs to do with them. But uh, until then, you know, what can we say? But one of the reasons they absolutely hate and detest John Calvin is because he was a firm believer in the doctrine of election. And God forbid you figure out that those that have faith, saving faith in Christ, are the elect, the chosen people of God. I mean, oh, they hate that idea. They absolutely detest that. Of course, if you want to believe that the Antichrist, those claiming to be Jews, are God's chosen people, well, you can do that. So, but I don't think so. What is an Antichrist? Well, how about we use the King James Bible to explain? In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 22, it says, Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, or the Messiah. So, anybody that denies that Jesus is the Christ is a liar. But it also, the next sentence says, He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Hmm says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. And all Jews deny Jesus, and that makes them antichrist. Because if they believed in Jesus, then they would be Christians. And don't tell me about Messianic Jews. They're Jews. And they're still waiting their Messiah to show up. If they're ashamed to be called Christians... They're not. So, and if you don't believe me, call any synagogue and ask them if Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah. And if Jews do not accept Jesus as Messiah, then who is their Messiah? Oh, the Antichrist who's going to come when they rebuild their temple. And you watch every single so-called Messianic Jew will proclaim that Messiah has come when they build a temple and the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, the Antichrist, comes. You watch every single stinking one of them. You want to know why they don't like Paul? They're the ones that are behind this hate Paul movement. Because in 1 Corinthians 16, chapter 22, Paul writes, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. What does that mean? It's a Greek word. It means cursed. You don't love the Lord Jesus, you're cursed. Let him be anathema maranatha. So are Jews cursed? Absolutely. And God forbid you believe Christians are the chosen people, the elect, like Calvin taught. Oh, that's a dirty word. No, no, no. The Antichrist. That's who the modern church world will tell you are his chosen people. Well, yeah, they are chosen, but not for the kingdom. They're chosen for the lake of fire because they reject Christ. So, now you know why they rail on the Geneva Bible and John Calvin. So let's look at King James. Well, King James, you know his writings actually exist to this day. Not only was he a Christian, he was a scholar. That man had the best education that England offered at the time. You could read his writings. 
He wrote about Satanism and witchcraft against it, not for it. He wrote some doctrinal books. I mean, the guy was a king, and he knew the Bible. Why do you think you spent all that money and time assembling the greatest scholars of his day to translate the Bible into English against the wishes of the Vatican, the Catholic Church, and the Pope. There's a reason for that. You can read about the lives of the people that he picked, whom King James picked, to work on the Bible. If uh, memory serves me correctly, they were divided into three groups. And each group would translate a portion of the Bible and then when they were done, they would give it to the other group for review and revision. And then this way, no one group could mistranslate anything because they were all, well, they were all believers and they were scholars. Unlike the Vatican, you know, they're, they're scholars in tradition. But Jesus didn't say anything, anything good about traditions. So, there was a time when Oxford and Cambridge universities were Bibles colleges. Same thing with Harvard. A lot of your universities, the Ivy League, they were Bible colleges. When you went to law school, you were taught the Bible law. Oh, you committed murder? You were to be put to death. Now, seriously, uh, what was his name? Sir Lancelot something or other. You could read about this guy. I mean, these guys knew Greek. They knew Hebrew. They knew English. They were scholars, people. When you look at the NIV Bible, they had a lesbian and a sodomite on their committee. And guess what? The 1984 edition of the NIV, you could not even prove that sodomy was a sin. You couldn't prove it. Not from their Bible. Because everywhere it said sodomite in the King James, in the NIV it said shrine prostitute. Uh... What is a shrine prostitute? Is that a male or a female? Maybe both. I don't know. And where is the shrine? Is it okay to be a prostitute as long as you don't do it at the shrine? Or is it okay to do it at the shrine as long as you're not a prostitute? You know, do it for free, right? I, you know, but the King James says sodomite. And you want to know something? Jewish groups want to totally get rid of the, New, uh, the King James New Testament. Or at the very least, put warning stickers on it that it is anti-Semitic. Because they say that Jesus was the most anti-Semitic evil person that ever lived in the history of the earth. What does that tell you? Hmm. And of course, your people will tell you, oh yeah, it was the Vatican that killed Jesus. Well, that's not my King James Bible. My King James Bible says Pilate wanted to release him. What can I tell you? So King James, you could read his Bible writings to this day. It's out there. The guy believed and the scholars that he assembled to translate the Greek and the Hebrew into English, they were believers and scholars also. Now, let me ask you a question. You probably heard that they say, well, you know, King James was a sodomite. Okay. Here's the question. What does the King James Bible say to do with sodomites? It says to put them to death. 
You think a sodomite who wanted to have a Bible put together would leave that in a Bible if he was a sodomite? Oh yeah, I'm a sodomite, but I want to leave in the Bible where it says to put, put me to death in there. I mean, really? Are you that stupid? I mean, really? The Bible also says, my King James, that Satanists and witches were to be put to death. Of course, the modern church world says, well, you know, Jesus came and he changed the law and he really doesn't want us to do that. You know, just because they've caught witches stealing babies out of hospitals for, you know, whatever, blood sacrifice, I don't know. Well, that's what they're doing. You know, they might turn to Jesus and get saved. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus didn't revoke the law. He, he fulfilled the law of blood sacrifice. You think you think we want God wants murderers to be put in prison forever so that they can escape and kill again? No, he wants them put to death. There are capital crimes in the Bible. And witchcraft and sodomy were among those. So was murder. But there's a difference between uh, killing somebody on an accident and waiting for them to come out of the house with a baseball bat so you can club them upside the head and split their head open. There's a big difference between that. You think sodomites and Satanists would want to, would hate the King James Bible when it says to put them to death? Of course they would. So what do they do? They'll tell you, oh, King James was a sodomite. Don't use his Bible. And then they'll tell you, oh, well, you know, he was a Mason. He was a Freemason. Because if you look at his original Bible, it's full of Masonic symbols. Well, I got a question. Were the symbols on the King James Bible adopted by the Masons afterwards? Or was the printer, the publisher of the King James Bible, were they Masons secretly and slip in those satanic Masonic symbols? I mean, I don't know the answer. But I don't think King James was a member of the secret society. I don't think so, but... And he certainly wasn't a sodomite. And he certainly did not like witches and witchcraft. He wrote a book against it. Now, isn't it strange how all the sodomite churches in San Francisco, their, one of their favorite Bibles is the NIV. Of course, there's been revisions to the NIV. They've changed several there's been several revisions to it so if you quote one version of it the somebody will come along and quote let's say you quote the 1984 version they'll take the 1987 version and say no he's lying it doesn't say that well the 87 may not say that but the 84 does i you know just that's how it works and then they'll say the King James was uh, changed. Well, there was a revision to the King James Bible. There absolutely was. Because in 1769, they revised the King James Bible to standardize the spellings. Because the original spellings were in what they call Middle English, and they were, uh, well, I took English literature in college, and we read, you know, Beowulf and all those old things. So I'm familiar with uh, Old English. 
And Old English is very similar to German. I, they're sister languages, by the way. So, you know, it's, it's a question of what are you going to believe? The modern Bibles that use Vatican manuscripts translated by sodomites and Satanists and lesbians? Or are you going to stick with a Bible that has a over 400 year history? Yeah, 1611. I tell you, that's what I'm going to stick with. Another thing, too, is what I call the law of first mention. Well, some other people call it that before I did, but let's say you get a word that you don't know exactly what it means and you didn't have access to a dictionary. Well, in the King James, all you got to do is go to the first time that word appears. And in the context of what's there, the paragraph or whatever, It'll explain what it means, case in point. All right, for example, dog, a four-legged creature, sometimes a two-legged creature. In Exodus chapter 11 and verse 7, but against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue. Now we're talking about uh, speaking ill against Israel. Okay? But against any of the children of Israel, Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. All this is parallelism. It's telling you that it's, it's comparing the Egyptians to that of a dog. Now, what about uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 17? There shall be no whore, there shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel. And what does the Bible say to do with whores? Kill them. What do you do with whoremongers? You kill them. You know, God wanted one man and one woman, marriage. That's what the Lord wants, you know. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Listen to this, verse 18. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore... What is a hire of a whore? So, you know, the uh, the prostitutes, the wages of a prostitute? That's what I think. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog. See, it's comparing a dog to a sodomite. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel, Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. You don't take these people's money into the house of the Lord for a vow or an offering. You don't want their money. For even both these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. And what is an abomination? Well, an abomination is a sin that God really, really, really hates. Did you know that Harry Potter book series on the magician, saucer, whatever you want to call him, has outsold the Bible recent, uh, at least one year? Can you imagine that? I mean... In nine, on June 6, 1966, 
a Jew by the name of Anton Levy, calls himself Levy, created or founded the Church of Satan. And, of course, the church was fine with that. Oh, well, you know, we can't put them to death. Uh, uh, he might get saved. I don't think so. He's somewhere, he's somewhere right now, but it's not in the kingdom. That's for sure. And what happened after 1966? Well, in the late 60s, you had the so-called sexual revolution. Women started taking the pill so they wouldn't get pregnant, so that they could have sex without having to worry about children. They even called it the pill. The pill. I remember these days. I mean, almost when I was a young kid, there was almost no divorced people. People stayed together. But that all changed in the late 60s. Uh, drugs, pharmacia, became very, very prevalent. I mean, it's just totally, ch everything changed in the late 60s, mid to late 60s. Everything went down the tubes in our country. They took prayer out of the school, public schools, around 1963-1964. Uh, God forbid we have Bible reading and prayer in Jesus' name. Yeah, teen pregnancies went through the roof. Uh, venereal disease, VD, or what they call STDs now, sexually transmitted diseases, through the roof. So, ours is a... The West, not just America, but Europe. It's just, we are now witnessing all the Bible plagues and judgments against us for our casting off our first love and not doing what the Bible says to do. So, there's even a group called NAMBLA, North American Manboy Love Association. Now, they don't even call them sodomites anymore. Now they call them minor attracted people. Hmm. Yep. And somebody showed me one of their magazines from the 70s that they encouraged their members to become Catholic priests, to infiltrate the church, the Catholic church, so-called, and destroy it from within. And you wonder why you got so many of them priests playing with the altar boys. Uh, it was all planned, people. And instead, of, you know, those people, they should be put to death. I think, you know, if you put all these to death, uh, if they wanted to live, they'd keep it in their pants. But we don't do that anymore. Oh, they might get saved. I don't think so. I don't think so. I have yet to read one verse in the Bible where a Satanist comes to the Lord or a sodomite. I just don't see it. But so law first mention. So if you don't understand a word, you can always go to the first mention of that word in the King James. The modern Bibles do away with that. You'll never make the connection. When the Bible uses a word or a phrase, there's a string of, I guess you could say, like a doctrinal string that is woven into the Bible. So, for example, the plagues of Egypt, very similar to what's going on, with, well, was what will go on during the vials and the seals in the book of Revelation in the end times. Very similar. But if you 
read the modern Bibles, they they change things so you don't make the word connection. Now, another thing, too. When I was reading Gail Ripplinger's book, her original on the King James Bible, the her original book, I don't remember what it's called now, but I may not agree with all her conclusions, but I'm not saying she's wrong. But if you look at the things that the modern Bibles delete and change, that tells you the direction that the satanic people are trying to lead the remnant church away from. For example, now we're going to cover this more in a later study. But in Genesis chapter 6, it says that the sons of God married the daughters of men and had giants born to them. Now, when you read Job chapter 38, you realize that the, in the King James anyways, that the sons of God shouted for joy at the foundation of the earth. The creation of the earth, the sons of God were shouting for joy. Adam did not exist until six days after the earth was created. So how could the sons of God be Adam when he didn't even exist yet? Now, Adam was a son of God. Jesus is called the only begotten son of God. But the sons of God, when you realize in Job 38, are angels, because after all, who was their father? God. But when you read Job 38, and then contrast that with Genesis chapter 6, where it said, the sons of God married the daughters of men, and they had giants for children. Giants for children. And then people will tell you that, well, you know, these were just good godly men, and then they married these ungodly women. Sometimes they'll tell you, well, it was the sons of Seth versus the daughters of Cain. But when do believers marry unbelievers and have giants for children? And then they'll say, well, you know, they were just tall. You know, everybody else was five foot, and these people were, you know, five foot nine, so they look like giants. Well, the Bible tells you what Goliath, his dimensions were. He was like over nine foot tall. That's a giant to me. Even to a basketball player, that's a pretty big guy. So, and, and that's, you know, <laughs> what can I tell you? But they want you to believe that a believer married an unbeliever and had giants for children. That's what they want you to believe. And then they'll say, oh, well, angels can't have sex. Well, how about Matthew chapter 22? The Sadducees came to Jesus uh, uh, Sadducees were a branch of the Jews. And they were saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, he died, and having no issue, no children, left his wife unto his brother, likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, now the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. So they say, therefore, in this resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, you do err. That's where you get the word error from. You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Boy, not only are you guys wrong, you're really wrong. You don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. Verse 30, Jesus speaking. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. And that's where it ends with the modern Bibles. Well, no, I'm sorry. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given a marriage, but are as the angels of God. 
but are as the angels of God. See, that's proof. God's angels cannot have sex. But in the King James Bible, these two words are there. Listen to this. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given a marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But are the angels of God in heaven. See, not all the angels are in heaven. But the Revelation says that they were cast out. The evil ones, the bad angels, the fallen angels. That's why they're called fallen angels. They fell from heaven. Well, actually, they were kicked out. But it's amazing. Those two last words totally disprove what they try to tell you that, oh, angels can't have sex. They'll leave out those last two words. I mean, let's face it. One word makes a big difference. Hey, uh, can I borrow $20 from you? I'll pay you Friday. I will not pay you Friday. One word. Big difference, right? How about, uh, can I borrow 20 bucks? I'll pay you back. How about, can I borrow 20 bucks? I will never pay you back. One word changes the meaning totally. They know this. And of course, they'll say, well, you know, the King James Bible added in heaven, but are the, as the angels in heaven. No, I don't think so. I think they leave it out. Now, why in the world would the evil ones want you to believe that angels can't have sex? Well, that falls into their little game to anybody can be saved. All you got to do is believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. But when you realize that the fallen angels got the women pregnant, created giants, and the Canaanites, and not all the Canaanites were giants, people. There's a reason why God said to go into the land, Israel, go into the land and kill all the Canaanites. They were satanic seed line. Read the parable of the wheat and the tares. The Bible says that the tares were the children of the wicked one. The weeds. You know, when you understand these basic Bible doctrines that are plain as day in the King James Bible, it makes sense. You read the modern Bible, mo modern Bibles, and confusion. Oh, but they're so much easier to read. No, they're not. No, they're not. Just because you're not familiar with a, a word that's com not, you know common, like harlot, look it up. A harlot, a harlot's a whore. Just because you don't, you know, you don't use it in everyday language, you know, look it up. I mean, come on, people. But they don't. The evil ones do not want you to know there's a satanic seed line on this earth. We are in a war. And most people don't even know they're in a war. They don't even know who the enemy is. There's an army against them. And they don't even know who the enemy is. Oh, anybody could be saved. They just got to believe in Jesus. Yeah, even the devil and the fallen angels believe in Jesus but they're not saved. There's a reason why God said, go into the land of Canaan and kill all the Canaanites. Kill everything that breathes. There's a reason for that. They were not of God's planting. We're going to cover that in more detail later on. Now, how about some other stuff that the purveyors of the fake Bibles will say, oh, well, the King James Bible added. How about Matthew chapter 17 and verse 14? 
And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Now remember, Jesus gave them his disciples power over devils. Why is this guy falling into the fire and into the water? The devil's trying to kill this kid, his son. What did Jesus say? Verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer or allow? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Yeah, bring, bring your son here. Verse 18. And Jesus rebuked the devil. Ah, the guy was possessed of a devil. And he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? Why couldn't we do this? Verse 20. Matthew 17, 20. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. Uh, really? Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, Ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. The modern Bibles will tell you, Oh, see, they didn't have faith. That's why they couldn't do it. And they remove verse 21. But listen to what Jesus said after this. How be it, this kind, what do you mean this kind? This kind of devil. Obviously, this was a very powerful, high-ranking devil. Not your run-of-the-mill devil. No, this is a powerful one. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Do you know that certain devils have to be removed? Not just by faith, but by prayer and fasting. The modern Bibles delete this. Well, you know, the King James Bible, it... It adds. You think the Bible, author, the author of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, you think uh, God wants prayer and fasting? Fasting and prayer? Absolutely. You really think they added this? Uh, do you think that maybe the Devils would not want us to know how to cast them out of people with fasting and prayer. Absolutely. They don't want to leave. They want to stick around as long as possible. And then people will say, oh, they added this in the Bible. It doesn't belong there. It's not in the older and better manuscripts by the Vatican, under the Vatican's control. No, thank you. And like I say, one of the greatest forgers that ever lived said on his deathbed said that he forged the Sinaiticus manuscripts. And there are thousands of words that are not in those manuscripts that are in the King James. Do you know there's 5,000 partial manuscripts? that back up the King James. Those Bible scholars, you think they didn't know what manuscripts to use? Of course they did. The Greek church preserved God's words. They are the most persecuted church in the history of the church. They, they were the ones who were responsible for evangelizing Eastern Europe, Russia, you know, Soviet Russia that murdered millions of believers in the lifetime of my deceased father, basically in the last hundred years. 
They murdered millions of believers, millions of Christians, probably because they used icons. Icon is a image. You know, you have the Catholic Church, they bow down to statues. Can you imagine bowing down to a, a statue made of concrete with some paint and asking for forgiveness and a blessing and calling it Mary? I mean, how stupid do you have to be? But the Orthodox Church, uh, they'll paint a picture, let's say on a stained glass window, and they'll, they'll pray there and say, oh, this is St. John. Let's pray to St. John. I think that's why the Lord allowed them to be destroyed over the last hundred years under communism, the Soviet, Soviet communism. Millions murdered for their faith. So, should we trust the King James Bible? And let me tell you something. I was, for a while there, I was, uh, getting, I got in contact with the uh, Greek Orthodox Church of the United States, USA. And as I understood it, they were actually considering doing a version, a modern version of the Greek New Testament scriptures. And they started looking at it comparing it with the King James and they gave up and I asked why 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 did, did you give up you know doing a modern translation of the Greek scriptures they said well we looked at the King James and decided we could not improve on it so we gave up the idea I mean what is that for a testimony People that could read Greek and English. And they said they couldn't improve on the King James. Now, I think that Geneva is a fine version. Uh, people say that the Septuagint of the, the Greek of the Old Testament, which was done, I think, in Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, supposedly, that's a good translation, but, you know, I don't need that. I got the King James. And I believe the Lord showed me supernaturally that the King James was God's word. But I don't want to get into that too much. So, are we going to trust modern Bibles? How about the Queen, Queen James Version? Where they removed all those homophobic references... Yeah, there is actually a Queen James Bible. Believe it or not, there is. I don't know how popular it is over in San Francisco, but I know they love the NIV. So what can I tell you? Are we going to stick with the old, with what works, what the world hates the most, or are we going to go with the new? I heard a preacher once say, if it's new, it's probably not true. And if it's not true, it's probably new. So King James is over 400 years old. It worked. And there were revivals using the King James Bible. Not only in the United States, but in England. Revivals. You ever see a revival with the NIV? No, never. And let me tell you something, people. When there is a real revival, bars and liquor stores are going to close. Movie theaters are going to close down. Abortion clinics will go out of business. I don't see that happening. I do not see that happening. There's never been a revival with a modern Bible. Never been a revival. Never. But there has been revivals using the King James and Geneva Bibles. But it's been a long time. 
The Lord says judgment begins at the house of God. And people, that's where we're heading. So, all right, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.